Hello and welcome back to the class Introduction to Orthodoxy. This is the 10th presentation in the series. I'm Father John Brown. I'm one of the priests at Holy Transfiguration Greek Orthodox Church in Marietta, Georgia. So now we continue our study uh, today. Let's go ahead and begin. The image of God and humanity, who are we? Orthodoxy believes that every human being is created in the image and likeness of God. Put another way, we are all icons of God. He created us in his image with the ultimate goal that we may become, become perfected in his likeness. In the book of Genesis, we read, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. So we see in the very first chapter, in the first few verses of the Bible, this important topic, which is the image of God in humanity. And this is an end I would uh, this is not just for Christians, this is for every human being ever born. It is this image of God with the potential to grow into his likeness that gives us extraordinary dignity among all creation. The stars, the planets, and the moons do not have it. The plants do not have it. The animals do not have it. Even the angels do not have it. It is also this image of God in humans that gives us the capacity to have a deep loving relationship with God, with him. He does not love any of his other creatures the same way he loves us. Orthodoxy recognizes this profound value of the image of God in each human being and rejects the intentional taking of any human life. This is why the church reject, rejects capital punishment, abortion, euthanasia, and disapproves of war. This, the this is a, this is all these uh, positions of the church come directly from the fact that we believe all human souls are in, inherently and supremely valuable, and we do not take any of the uh, we don't approve of any of the taking of that life. Among the many gifts of God that God gave human to Adam and Eve, which reflected his reflect his image, was free will. To humanity, God has given the mysterious ability to even reject God's love. It did not take long for Adam and Eve to exercise their free will with terrible consequences. First, their relationship with God, which had been previously harmonious, was now severely damaged. After Adam and Eve partook of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil and had fallen, this is the first thing uh, we first noticed the results of their disobedience. Genesis 3, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam <clears throat> and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. <clears throat> then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? God, of course, knew the answer to that question, but this was the first time where there was a very detectable distance and estrangement between Adam and Eve and the God who had created them. God had never had to say, where are you, before. Second, their relationship with each other, which had been previously harmonious, was now severely damaged. One of the first things that Adam said after the fall, then to the man he said, then the man said, the woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. So we see here, First, uh, Adam blaming Eve for what he had chosen to do with his own free will. He was beginning a very human and common uh, fail, uh, failure, which is to not expect to not accept responsibility for our own actions. But our first instinct is often to pass the blame on to someone else, even if they're entirely innocent. Third, God's creation, which had been previously in harmony, was now also severely damaged. God says in Genesis 3, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both the thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. Before this, acquiring food was very easy. 
In fact, it was growing and all they had to do is approach the tree or, or vine or bush, pluck it and eat it and enjoy it. It took, and what labor there was involved was a pleasant labor, a meaningful labor, a fulfilling labor. But from that point on, and it continues to this day, for us to earn our living and for us to, to, to eat and to, to partake of, of the material abundance of the earth, now we have to work very hard for it. And now we will, it will not always be pleasant. And if you've ever been in a bad work situation, you have experienced the modern outworking of what God was warning of when he said, both thorns and thistles, it shall bring for you. So we are all at times in our lives have to endure thorns and thistles in our labors. Finally, pain, illness, decay, and death entered into humanity. God said, to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Then to Adam, he said, in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread and you will return to the ground for out of it you were taken for dust you are and to dust you shall return. So the ultimate and most enduring and universal aspect of the fall was that humanity would uh, now death every human being that is born will eventually die and when and when we do that we return to the the dust from which we were taken and this this intrusion of death into a relationship and a place that knew no death that knew no want that that was immortal was now rendered fully mortal and that is certainly true even to this day Orthodoxy views the fall less harshly than does much of Western Christianity. In the West, Adam and Eve are often viewed as willing rebels against God. But in the East, we see them as being deceived by Satan and in need of correction and healing. Also in Western theology, there is a tendency to see man's image as being nearly destroyed. It follows the sentiment of this verse from Jeremiah. The heart, of, is, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So from this verse in Jeremiah and a few others like it, in the West there's a tendency to reduce fallen humanity almost to subhuman levels. Some of, the Western, some of Western theology goes as far as the doctrines taught by the Protestant reformer John Calvin, who called mankind totally depraved and incapable of any good whatsoever. Calvin believed that humanity had fallen so far that we have completely lost our free will. This led, led him to embrace the doctrine of predestination, the belief that man cannot make any good decision right, and therefore the only way man can be saved is for God to choose humanity, and humanity has no ability to embrace or reject. There is no such thing anymore as free will. The free will was lost in the Garden of Eden. Orthodoxy is far less severe in its view of fallen man. We see man's image of God as stained, clouded, distorted, perhaps even damaged, but not destroyed. Man's nature is sick, but not dead. Our free will is errant, but it is not erased. Salvation is the undoing of the fall and the ultimate perfection of humanity the repair of the damage to our relationship with God and with each other, the end to illness, decay, and death. Ultimately, even nature and the whole creation will also be healed and perfected. What is salvation? You use that term a lot in all of Christianity, East and West. But what does it mean? Where does the word come from? What, so here we'll look at this. Uh, the word salvation is a basic word in the Christian vocabulary, but that word is not always understood correctly. It is the English translation of the Greek word soteria, and in the ancient Greek world, soteria was a pagan goddess known for offering of safety, salvation, deliverance, and protection from harm. She was also associated with healing. So therefore, when we hear the word salvation, it should be translated, we should derive from it the understanding of deliverance, healing, restoration, and protection. That is the context of which the Greek word soteria, from which, from which the English word salvation comes from, comes from these concepts. The masculine for soteria is sotir, 
as you can see, there's a statue apparently of Sotir. Sotir. The male counterparts of Soteria in ancient Greek mythology were Dionysius Sotir and Asclepius Sotir, the gods of healing, deliverance, and protection. So hence salvation should be translated and understood in, in, in its original context, which is deliverance, healing, restoration, and protection. The word sin is another essential part of the Christian vocabulary, but few Christians know what that word actually means. The English word sin is translated from the Greek word hamartia. It is a term from archery, which refers to the varying degrees to which an arrow missiles, misses the bullseye. So if you've ever seen archers compete or have seen it on TV, or even if you haven't, it's easy to understand. You're aiming for, for the bullseye, the very, very best shots hit the bullseye, but for every bullseye, there are plenty far and far more attempts that had some degree of distance between where the arrow hit and the bullseye. Whatever that distance is, be it a tiny near miss or a giant miss, that's, that's hamartia, that's sin in the, in the original word, uh, Greek word, which is, comes down to us in our language as sin. The Orthodox East still, still views sin and salvation in their original Greek meanings. To us, the missing of the mark of sin is seen as the missing of perfection of the bullseye, a perfect relationship with God and with each other. In salvation, we see salvation, we see protection from harm as protection from the destructive results of sin, not having a perfect relationship with God and each other. We also emphasize the healing aspect of salvation as the healing of our souls from the spiritual diseases that afflict us. The Eastern approach differs significantly from Western Christianity, both Roman Catholic as well as Protestant. They tend to see sin and salvation in judicial or juridical terms. In the West, the missing of the mark of sin is seen as a violation of God's law, and that that judicial understanding is not in the original, but it is definitely associated in Western theology, the missing of, of sin being a violation of God's law. And the protection from harm of salvation in its original context is now seen in the West as protection from the legal penalty of God's law. In the West, humanity meets God in a courtroom and is threatened with punishment. But in the East, we see humanity meeting God in a hospital room. More or less, the church is the hospital room, with healing as the goal. The West, we don't want to overemphasize this, and we, to be clear, the West also recognizes the healing aspect of salvation. So it's not a matter of they don't believe it and we do, but it is, the, the difference is that the West uh, believes it, but they don't emphasize it as much as we do. Uh, it is far less emphasized than in the East. Similarly, the East does recognize a legal aspect of salvation, but it is far less emphasized in the West. So uh, that's an important in point that it's not, it's not uh, one has, is, is one side or, or the other is completely wrong. Both East and West have, have similar beliefs, but in the, in the West and the East, there's a different emphasis between the healing aspect and the judicial aspect of salvation. The Orthodox Church profoundly believes that mankind cannot save itself. This is often misunderstood by our critics because we do believe, believe that humanity does have a role to play in their own salvation, primarily obedience to the commandments of God, and um, other Christian bodies do not believe that. So therefore, they make the error to the uh, erroneous assumption that Orthodox believe that we can work our way to heaven. That is... The, that is absolutely not true. They, uh, that is to say, we Orthodox basically say we cannot shelter ourselves from eternal harm. Only God can do that. We cannot heal ourselves. All along the process of salvation, we are totally dependent on God saving us. We cannot work our way to heaven on our own. And I wish to emphasize this because this is often a, a, a mischaracterization by some other Christian groups of what Orthodoxy believes. God has done everything necessary to save us. He sent prophets and messengers through the centuries. And finally, the second person of the Holy Trinity has assumed humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. 
He was born, grew up, lived among us, preached, taught, and performed many miracles of mercy. He voluntarily endured crucifixion, rose from the dead, and returned to heaven. Fifty days after his resurrection, he poured out the Holy Spirit upon the church, empowering it to save humanity, drawing humanity towards salvation, healing, and perfecting us. God has taken the first move. Now it's man's turn. We are called to respond to God's overture of love for us. Orthodox call this cooperation between God and man synergy from the Greek word synergia, which literally means working together. How do we respond? We start with Peter's message at Pentecost, the day the church was born. And his answer, this, this message that he gave was an answer to the question from the crowd, what must we do to be, uh, meaning in the context, what must we do to be saved? Peter said at Pentecost, in answer to this question, what must we do in this context to be saved? Peter said, do four things. Acts chapter two. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. The first action that Peter mentions is to repent. This is extremely important. Christ said, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. The Greek word, the English word repent comes from the Greek word metania, <clears throat> which means change of mind. We cease to think as before in metania, concerning, concerned mostly about ourselves, our hopes, our desires, and being mindful of our place in this world. But in repentance after metania, or along the path of metania, repentance, we change our previous way of thinking and become concerned about God and others. We honestly ex acknowledge our moral shortcomings. We stop trying to live our lives without God. We begin to focus on knowing him better, honoring him and loving him. As a consequence, we also strive to treat others better. We become mindful of our place, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. Some modern Christians see repentance as being a one-time event which saves us forever. They interpret peace, Peter's words at Pentecost to mean, repent now and you will be saved forever no matter what. Orthodoxy views repentance as a way of life. We are constantly striving to align our ways with God's ways. We are constantly evaluating our progress and making corrections as necessary. We interpret Peter's Pentecost words as always repent. The ultimate goal is not only healing from our fallen condition, but also perfection in the likeness of God. The second action from Peter's Pentecost sermon is, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. This is the second of his four-part answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? So orthodoxy believes that baptism is normally a prerequisite for salvation, although we have no doubt that God makes exceptions to people who are unable to be baptized, such as the thief on the cross. Christ himself describes the importance of baptism in salvation. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The rest of the New Testament states that baptism is a part of salvation. In Acts chapter 22, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. In 1 Peter chapter 3, there is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mark 16, 16 says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Titus 3.5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So these verses and others like it are why the Orthodox definitely identify the beginning of the process 
of our salvation, the beginning of the process of our deification is in baptism. This is why in baptism is an absolute requirement to have a sacramental connection with the church. The third action item of how to be saved, according to Peter's Pentecost sermon is, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Orthodoxy has a term for the process of receiving the third person of the Holy Trinity, Holy Trinity into our lives and steadily increasing his presence in us for the rest of our lives, resulting in our salvation. We call it deification, which comes from the Greek word theosis, which means to become divinized. In fact, to be deified is virtually synonymous with being saved and being perfected. Saint Seraphim of Sarov, a wonderful Russian saint from the 18th century, puts it this way. <clears throat> the true aim of our Christian life consists of the acquisition of the Holy Spirit of God. As for the fasts and vigils and prayer and almsgiving and every good deed done for Christ's sake are only the means of acquiring the Holy Spirit of God. Paul describes what the Orthodox call, uh, call deification. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Peter describes what orthodoxy calls deification by which you have been given to, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature these are quite astonishing claims of the scripture but it's in the bible that we can be filled with uh, more and more even to the to the fullest with the presence of god within us deification does not mean that we become little gods we always remain completely human, but deification does mean that we mere mortals have the capability to be filled with the presence of God to an ever-increasing degree and become perfected in God's likeness. Many modern Orthodox Christians believe that salvation, no, modern Christians, not Orthodox, many modern Christians believe that salvation takes place in a moment, but Orthodoxy teaches that salvation which is for us deification and perfection, is a lifelong process, perhaps even an eternal process, according to St. Gregory of Nyssa. The arrival of the Holy Spirit in us can sometimes be mysterious. We cannot always predict his movements. As Christ said, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So we do not know where the Holy Spirit is not, but we do know where he is. We know for certain that we, sac we sacramentally receive the Holy Spirit at chrismation. This sacrament consists of the anointing of the Holy Myrrh, which is also called chrism, blessed for this purpose by a bishop. Its roots go back to the Old Testament. Kings were anointed with holy oil to their office. Saul in 1 Samuel 9, David in 1 Samuel 16, and priests were anointed to their priesthood with holy oil, as was Aaron in, in Leviticus 8 and referred to in Psalm 132 too. Chrismation, or the anointing of holy myrrh or holy chrism, always occurs right after the sacrament of baptism in the Orthodox Church. Those who have been previously baptized in a Trinitarian Christian group are often received into the Orthodox Church with chrismation only. Regardless, Every Orthodox has been chrismated and received the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is our own personal Pentecost. The fourth and final action item from Peter's Pentecost sermon is that salvation is offered to our children as well, not just adults. For Peter says in his sermon, for the promise is to you and to your children. The inclusion of children in the process of salvation was also in the Old Testament. God commanded that Jewish male infants should be circumcised at eight days old. Circumcision was no mere symbol. It had profound spiritual ramifications. In Genesis 17, when God is commanding that the, the, the firstborn or all boys that are born in, in Judaism be circumcised, he says this, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. 
So we see here that the in Old Testament circumcision, it was not just a symbol. It was if you were circumcised, you were within the covenant that God had with his Old Testament people. If you were not circumcised, you could be as 100% Jewish by ancestry, but without circumcision, you were not included in God's covenant. Christ taught that children can participate in the process of salvation. He said in Matthew 19, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of heaven. This verse and others like it are why the Orthodox church baptizes, chrismates and offers holy communion to infants and children. Some modern Christians reject baptism of infants on the grounds that infants are not capable of faith or understanding the meaning of their baptism. To them, the efficacy of baptism depends on the awareness of the person being baptized. Orthodoxy disagrees with this. The church has been baptizing infants since the beginning. St. Peter in the baptism of the household of Cornelius and St. Paul and the baptism of the household of the jailer. These are two cases from the Bible when, when the head of the household embraced Christ and received baptism, everyone in the household received baptism. And this presumably included uh, children and even servants. Taking a civic example, when does a person born in the United States become a US citizen? Of course, the moment they are born, yet they receive all the constitutional rights and privileges of US citizenship without understanding any of it at birth. It is so with baptism. The New Testament directly compares baptism to Old Testament circumcision. The Apostle Paul writes in Colossians 2, in him you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. So here we see a, a direct connection between circumcision of the Old Testament and baptism in the New Testament. We have already seen that the Old Testament circumcision was uh, uh, brought the baby into covenant with God, even though the baby was only eight days old. The efficacy of circumcision was not affected by the baby's understanding of it. It is the same with the New Testament, a, a, a counterpart of Old Testament uh, circumcision, and that is baptism. To the Orthodox, baptism is a mystery where God acts in a mystical way in our lives and for our salvation. This brings us to the broader issue of sacraments, are also called in, in the Orthodox Church called mysteries. Traditionally, the sacraments have been known as mysteries in the Orthodox Church. This description emphasizes that in these special events of the church, God is present and acts through the prayers and actions of his people in a mysterious or mystical way for the benefit of the people. Not only do the sacraments disclose and reveal God to us, but also serve to make us receptive to him. All the sacraments affect our personal relationship with God and with one another. The Holy Spirit works through the sacraments. He leads us to Christ, who unites us with the Father. By participating in the sacraments, we grow closer to God and receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The sacraments pour out God's grace into our lives. In the sacraments, God takes simple everyday things like water and oil and bread and wine and the spoken word and uses them to supernaturally transform us. The Orthodox recognize many sacraments, even though some people think or speak of only seven. Here are a few of them. Baptism, chrismation, Eucharist, which we've already discussed, confession, holy unction, marriage, ordination, funeral, monastic tonsure, the great blessing of the water of theophany, the small blessing of the water done when necessary, and the consecration of a temple or church. Let's look a little bit at baptism. By this sacrament, we become Orthodox Christians and are fully received into the household of faith. The church baptizes us by immersion into water because that's what the word Greek word for baptism means. We also baptize by triple immersion, one for each person of the Holy Trinity. This includes infants. By this sacrament, we are united with Christ in his death and resurrection. All our past sins are washed away. We become members of the body of Christ, which is the church. You can see here a, a, a picture of an infant baptism and 
and we at, at the baptismal service we process around the, the baptismal font together and sing the hymn as many as have been baptized into christ have put on christ hallelujah then we've mentioned already this the another sacrament the next sacrament and that is the gift of the holy spirit and chrismation chrismation is a personal pentecost the oil or chrism is blessed by the bishop and used for this specific purpose it is not the same as the oil of gladness used before baptism or any other oil. It is applied all over the body, and each place that it is applied all over the body has its own separate meaning. It is applied to the forehead as the Holy Spirit now guides our thoughts. It is applied to our eyes as the Holy Spirit now guides what we see. It is applied to our nostrils as the Holy Spirit now guides what we smell. It is applied to the mouth as the Holy Spirit now guides what we say. It is applied to the throat as the Holy Spirit now guides what we eat and drink. It is applied to our ears as the Holy Spirit now guides what we listen to. It is applied to our hands as the Holy Spirit now guides what we do. It is applied to the feet as the Holy Spirit now guides where we go. And it is applied to the back as the Holy Spirit now guides the burdens that we carry. And so here's a picture of chrismation, which in Orthodox baptismal services happens immediately after the baptism. And in each one of these places that are anointed with the Holy Chrism, also called Holy Myrrh, at each point, the anointing priest says, the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit, and all the people at each point say, Amen. Then there is communion, the body and blood of Christ. Holy communion, also called the Eucharist, is the center of our spiritual life. It is the supernatural food that nourishes and sustains our souls. It is the holiest object on earth. When we commune, the body and blood of Christ is carried to every cell in our bodies, and we literally become partakers of the divine nature, as described by Peter. We become Christ in you, the hope of glory, as described by the Apostle Paul. These, these verses become literally true for us. It is the deepest form of fellowship and spiritual intimacy between us and God and with, with each other. It is the closest experience that we of god that we can have on earth then the next sacrament is the sacrament of confession in the sacrament we acknowledge to god all the ways we have missed the mark we do so in the presence of a priest who usually gives spiritual guidance and always and notice i i, I put in boldface always guards the confidentiality of what has said anything said to a priest in confession never leaves his lips anywhere else, not to his family, not to anybody else. That's, there's extreme attention played to the con, uh, paid to the confidentiality of the sacrament of confession. At the end, the priest announces God's forgiveness of everything confessed. This is described, this process is described in John chapter 20. So Jesus said to the begin, he's talking to, to the, uh, the apostles now peace to you as the father has sent me i also send you and when he had said this he breathed on them and said to them receive the holy spirit if you forgive the sins of any they are forgiven them if you retain the sins of any they are retained so this is a specific ministry of the priesthood that god gave to the apostles and has been handed down by apostolic succession to every orthodox priest in the world and this is part of the priest's ministry it's not a power as much as as it is an entrustment uh to, to the ultimate person hearing the confession is god through the, in the presence of a priest we witness to god's work in confession but uh, that's the emphasis that's the way it's seen in the church the next sacrament is anointing Similar to confession is the sacrament of anointing, also called holy unction. The priest anoints the sick person with blessed oil, praying for healing of both soul and body. This comes from the book of James in chapter 5. James writes, is anyone among you sick? Let, them, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, 
he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now we come to the sacrament of marriage where the two become one flesh. God performed the first wedding in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 2, we read, And God said, This is now the bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. In the sacrament of marriage, the couple is joined together by a priest in the church in the company of witnesses who all pray for God's blessings in their married life. The goal of marriage is to provide the opportunity for the couple to assist each other on the path, path of salvation as the work, they work together to enter into the kingdom of God. The next sacrament is holy orders or the laying on of hands. In this sacrament of holy orders, or also called ordination, a bishop confers the gift of the Holy Spirit to a man who will access, ex exercise the office of deacon or presbyter slash priest in the church. First and Second Timothy describe this, right as P Paul is writing to his protege Timothy. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by the prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Later, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So they're referring to Paul's ordination of Timothy to carry on the ministry in his, his local area. Those are the, the sacraments that we are most familiar with, but there are others as well. In the consecration of a holy temple, the bishop anoints the holy altar table and the walls of the church with the same myrrh or chrism, which we use for chrismation. He also buries relics of martyrs in the altar table, and the grounds of the church are also consecrated through prayers and readings in three processions around the church building. Then there's the sacrament of monastic tonsure where men or women enter into the monastic life. In the monastic tonsure, the person is consecrated to God and makes a promise to live a life of poverty, obedience, and chastity. Orthodox mon monastics can be women, as you can see there. There's also other other sacraments. One uh, described here is the funeral offered only to Orthodox Christians in good standing with the church. Then there are other sacraments, such as the blessing of water that you see depicted there. Every action of prayer where the grace of God is invoked and bless and sanctify the people, the animals and objects, is a sacrament of the church. The great blessing of the waters in theophany offered only once a year. The small blessing of the waters offered frequently as needed. The blessing of homes, cars, boats, businesses, fields, animals, etc. The church is always blessing honorable things for the glory of God and for the service of his people. So this concludes the, this class. As is usual, here is my email address. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions on this slideshow. We will have three more of these classes, so please join us for uh, any or all of them, and until next time, may the Lord God bless all of you. Amen.